So in this video, I'm going to chronicle major events that occurred in the history of life once it got started. Uh, we're going to start by thinking about this theoretical idea. We've never found this species, but we just sort of propose that maybe at the very root of the tree of life, there should be some kind of uh, universal common ancestor to all of the modern life we see today. So what, what would we expect to see in this kind of species if it is sort of the, the ancestor to all species we see today? We propose that it maybe had DNA code, RNA code, and proteins to execute chemical jobs. It probably had some kind of membrane to control what came in and out of it. Uh, it was almost certainly in the oceans. We'll see that land life came later. It was almost certainly a prokaryote. We'll see that eukaryotes came later from prokaryotes. And it was probably a heterotroph. Remember that heterotrophs um, need others for their food or their energy. Um, so it probably just scavenged around for whatever it could find. Um, uh, and maybe again, that was about three and a half billion years ago, but you don't need to memorize dates. Uh, I'm just showing you that just to give you a sense of when these things happened. So what happened after that, I wanna argue that we're gonna kind of cover three major revolutionary events. The evolution of autotrophy, um, the ability for or some organisms to make their own food, um, the origin of eukaryotes, and then the origin of multicellular creatures uh, came much more recently in history. So let's start with autotrophy. Certainly the ability to make your own food is gonna be really important to get um, a food chain started. Remember autotroph means self. Uh, you can make your own food or energy from very simple sources. This would be photosynthesis in particular that I'm reminding you the formula of here. Um, although eventually we'll see that there are other ways to be an autotroph. Um, but certainly photosynthesis is a really important innovation that occurred at some point early in history too. We don't know exactly when, um, so I'm just kind of um, uh, giving you a ballpark estimate here. But again, the ability to make your own food really got food chain started because remember that the, at the base of any food chain is um, uh, our organisms that can make their own food. And then other organisms who specialized in eating them could come about later. But I also really want to emphasize this oxygen bias product that they just kind of release that's not the goal of photosynthesis and yet oxygen was really important in the history of life as well because maybe hundreds of billions of years of oxygen building up in the atmosphere eventually led to the ozone layer um, as it turns out free oxygen gas O2 can actually become ozone O3 high up in the atmosphere if you give it enough time and ozone is really important as we learned in ecology because ozone can block UV light and UV light can damage DNA and actually make it um, uh, uh, organisms die or unable to reproduce um, their their species um, and so without some kind of protection, we wouldn't think, we don't think that life on land would have ever been possible. Um, life was already protected in the oceans because of the water, uh, but um, without this kind of uh, a layer in the air, there wouldn't be life on land today without these little bacteria cranking out oxygen from photosynthesis. Okay, so um, maybe a billion years or so after all of that, maybe we finally start seeing some evidence of eukaryotic cells. Just as a quick reminder, eukaryotic cells have their own nucleus, or a little protective shell around the DNA. They also have specialist organelles that do particular jobs for the cell that prokaryotes don't have. Um, so how did these things form? Well, a lot of that is still unknown, um, perhaps the cell membrane could have kind of pinched in and formed these structures that have their own membranes like modern organelles do. Uh, maybe the same thing could have happened to form the nucleus. I'm going to focus on two particular organelles that we kind of have stronger evidence to think about how they are originated. Um, and uh, the two organelles are going to be the mitochondrion first. So the mitochondrion, you remember, uh, does uh, respiration. And respiration, remember, is cutting up sugar to make ATP. So as we think, uh, we think now, um, a larger prokaryotic cell might have actually kind of swallowed a smaller prokaryote that was maybe really good at doing cellular respiration. And maybe instead of digesting it and killing it, maybe this organism 
um, just kind of worked inside the larger organism and made lots of ATP for it. And so really it represents, we use this very fancy term to describe this event, an endosymbiosis is really just this idea that maybe the larger cell took in the smaller cell, so that's the endo part of it, and then they decided to work together over the long term, that's the symbiosis part of it. And so it's just kind of an internal symbiosis instead of two organisms working together, just kind of, you know, outside the body. Um, we think this also happened with the chloroplast in organisms and eukaryotes today that have a chloroplast like plants. Um, they still have mitochondria. We think that came first because all modern eukaryotes have mitochondria, but only some have a chloroplast. And so why the, why the mitochondria and the chloroplast? What evidence suggests that they were actually X bacteria, X uh, prokaryotes on their own? Well, as it turns out, they not only have their membra own membrane like all organelles do, but they have their own DNA and ribosomes as well. And remember, we kind of argued there are three things you need to be a cell. You need your own uh, DNA, your ribosomes to make proteins, and you need your own membrane. So they actually have everything they need to be their own cell. Uh, they can even uh, divide themselves inside of our cells with a little binary fission-like mechanism. Remember, that was the mechanism that prokaryotes use to do cell division. So um, kind of weird to think that there are little bacteria crawling inside of your cells right now, but there are, and they're actually helping you out. So no biggie. All right, and then maybe a billion years after that, multicellular life appears in the fossil record. Probably not exciting life like tigers and plants and things like that. Probably just kind of simple multicellular life like this pond algae. Um, but still definitely evidence of, of, or, of cells kind of working together um, and, and eventually uh, organisms are reproduced that are multicellular as well. Um, all we know is that you have to be eukaryotic in order to possibly be multicellular. We don't know why. We've never really seen multicellular bacteria before, but we haven't. Um, although I don't want you to go too far with that, um, not everybody who is eukaryotic is multicellular today. There still are single-celled eukaryotic species like amoeba, like paramecia, like yeasts, for example. Um, all, uh, so all we know is that maybe eukaryotic cells had to come first and then you could have multicellularity arise later. Okay, um, maybe about a half billion years after that, we finally see evidence of life on land. We're gonna actually talk about this a lot more in a future unit. So just to kind of preview that, we're gonna argue that the plants and the fungi and the animals that eventually invaded land from the oceans had a big challenge that they had to overcome. They had to overcome dehydration. Um, so losing too much water out of your cells to the dry air around you would cause you to die. And so what adaptations were fashioned is something we're going to talk about. All right, so we've kind of summarized major events. We kind of talked about the big three and in the order in which they occurred.